Hi, Miss Hernandez here. I'm back. <laughs> All right, so we are back in our novel, Island of the Blue Dolphins by Scott O'Dell. And we're gonna be in chapter 11 and 12 today. So again, you'll see the book pages there so you can read along with me and you'll hear my voice. And I will be asking questions as we go along just to have you think about. You can write down the questions and answers if you want. Pause the video to answer the questions to yourself. It's a really good skill to practice while we read. And also, as always, you'll have a Google form to do on the Google Slides. Hopefully they're working now and those can keep you guys engaged as well. And I'll probably start doing flip grids and Google forms, switching off between them um, because it's good to try different formats of questions. So I'm excited to see what happens in our next few chapters. So let's get into it. Chapter 11. I was awakened by the waves dragging at my feet. Night had come, but being too tired to leave the sand pit, I crawled to a higher place where I would be safe from the tide and again went to sleep. In the morning, I found the canoe a short distance away. I took the baskets, my spear, and the bow and arrows and turned the canoe over so the tides could not take it out to sea. I then climbed to the headland where I had lived before. I felt as if I had been gone a long time as I stood there, looking down from the high rock. I was happy to be home. Everything that I saw, the otter playing in the kelp, the ring of foam around the rocks that guarded the harbor, the gulls flying, the tides moving past the sand spit, filled me with happiness. I was surprised that I felt this way, for it was only a short time ago that I had stood on the same rock and felt that I could not bear to live here another day. So on this first page, Karan is talking about how she was feeling after coming back to the island. Why do you think it is she was surprised that she was happy to be back home? And why do you think her feelings changed? I looked out at the blue water stretching away, and all the fear I had felt during the time of the voyage came back to me. On the morning I first sighted the island, and it had seemed like a great fish sunning itself, I thought that some day I would make the canoe over and go once more to look for the country that lay beyond the ocean. Now I knew that I would never go again. The island of the Blue Dolphins was my home. I had no other. It would be my home until the white men returned in their ship, but even if they came soon, before next summer, I could not live without a roof or a place to store my food. I would have to build a house. But where? That night I slept on the rock, and the next day I began the search. The morning was clear, but to the north banks of clouds hung low. Before long, they would move across the island, and behind them many storms were waiting. I had no time to waste. I needed a place that was sheltered from the wind, not too far from Coral Cove and close to a good spring. There were two such places on the island, one on the headland and the other less than a league to the west. The headland seemed to be the more favorable of the two, but since I had been to the other for a long time, I decided to go there and make certain. The first thing I found, which I had forgotten, was that this place was near the wild dog's lair. As soon as I drew near to it, the leader came to the opening of the cave and watched me with his yellow eyes. If I built a hut here, I would first have to kill him and his pack. I planned to do this anyway, but I would take much time. The spring was better than the one near the headland, being less brackish and having a steadier flow of water. Beside it was much easier to reach, since it came from the side of a hill and not from a ravine as the other one did. It was also close to the cliff and a ridge of rocks which would shelter my house. The rocks were not so high as those on the headland, and therefore would give me less protection from the wind, yet they were high enough, and from them I could see the north coast and Coral Cove. The thing that made me decide on the place to build my house was the sea elephants. The cliffs here lay here fell away easily to a wide shelf that was partly covered when the tide came in. It was a good place for sea elephants because they could crawl halfway up the cliff if the day was stormy. On fair days, they could fish among the pools or lie on the rocks. The bull is very large and often weighs as much as 30 men. The cows are much smaller, but they make more noise than the bulls, screaming and barking through the whole day and sometimes at night. The babies are noisy too. On this morning, the tide was low and most of the animals were far out, just hundreds of specks against the waves, yet the noise they made was deafening. I stayed there the rest of the day looking around, and that night, at dawn when the clamor started again, I left and went back to the headland. There was another place to the south where I could have built my house, near the destroyed village of Gloss Ott, but I did not want to go there because it would remind me of the people who were gone. 
Also, the wind blew strong in this place, blowing against the dunes which cover the middle part of the island, so that most of the time sand is moving everywhere. Rain fell that night and lasted for two days. I made a shelter of brush at the foot of the rock, which kept off some of the water, and ate the food I had stored in the basket. I could not build a fire because of the rain, and I was very cold. On the third day, the rain ceased, and I went out to look for things which I would need in building the house. I likewise needed poles for a fence. I would soon kill the wild dogs, but there were many small red foxes on the island. They were so numerous that I could never hope to get rid of them, either by traps or with arrows. They were clever thieves, and nothing I stored would be safe until I had built a fence. The morning was fresh from the rain. The smell of the tide pools was strong. Sweet odors came from the wild grasses in the ravines and from the sand plants on the dunes. I sang as I went down the trail to the beach and along the beach to the sand spit. I felt that the day was an omen of good fortune. It was a good day to begin my new home. Okay, so as we saw in this chapter, and you'll see some more in the next, Karana is starting to get really creative. Or there's a describing word called enterprising, which means she's really having to come up with new and innovative ideas on the island. Why do you think she's starting to have to be this way? And why do you think it's important to be creative in her situation? Chapter 12. Many years before, two whales had washed up on the sand spit. Most of the bones had been taken away to make ornaments, but ribs were still there half buried in the sand. These I used in making the fence. One by one I dug them up and carried them to the headland. They were long and curved, and when I scooped out holes and set them in the earth, they stood taller than I did. I put the ribs together with their edges almost touching, and standing so that they curved outward, which made them impossible to climb. Between them I wove many strands of bulk kelp, which shrinks as it dies, dries, and pulls very tight. I would have used seal sinew to bind the ribs together, for this is stronger than kelp, but wild animals like it and soon would have gnawed the fence down. Much time went into its building. It would have taken me longer except that the rock made one end of the fence and part of a side. For a place to go in and out, I dug a hole under the fence just wide and deep enough to crawl through. The bottom and sides I lined with stones. On the outside, I covered the hole with a mat woven a brush to shed the rain, and on the inside with a flat rock which I would strong enough to move. I was able to take eight steps between the sides of the fence, which gave me all the room I would need to store the things I gathered and wished to protect. I built the fence first because it was too cold to sleep on the rock, and I did not like to sleep in the shelter I had made until I was safe from the wild dogs. The house took longer to build than the fence because it was... It rained many days, and because the wood which I needed was scarce. There was a legend among our people that the island had once been covered with tall trees. This was a long time ago, at the beginning of the world, when Tumayowit and Makat ruled. The two gods quarreled about many things. Tumayowit wished to die. Makat did not. Tumayowit angrily went down to, the, down to another world, under this world, taking his belongings with him. So people die because he did. In that time, there were tall trees, but now there were only a few in the ravines, and these were small and crooked. It was very hard to find one that would make a good pole. I searched many days, going out early in the morning and coming back at night, before I found enough for the house. So Karana built all sorts of structures for her house to kind of protect her, but how come she had to build a fence, and why did she do it first? I used the rock for the back of the house, and the front I left open since the wind did not blow from that direction. The poles I made of equal length, using fire to cut them as well as a stone knife, which may caused me much difficulty, because I had never made such a tool before. There were four poles on each side, set in the earth, and twice that many for the roof. These I bound together with sinew and covered with female kelp, which had broad leaves. The winter was half over before I finished the house, but I slept there every night and felt secure because of the strong fence. The foxes came when I was cooking my food and stood outside gazing through the cracks, and the wild dogs also came, gnawing at the whale ribs, growling because they could not get in. I shot two of them, but not the leader. While I was building the fence in the house, I ate shellfish and perch which I cooked on a flat rock. Afterwards, I made two utensils, Along the shore there were stones that the sea had worn smooth. 
most of them were round, but I found two with hollow places in the centers, which I deepened and broadened by rubbing them with sand. Using these to cook in, I saved the juices of the fish, which are good and were wasted before. For cooking seeds and roots, I wove a tight basket of fine reeds, which was easy because I had learned how to do it. My sister, Ulape. After the basket had dried in the sun, I gathered lumps of pitch on the shore, softened them over the fire, and rubbed them on the inside of the basket so that it wouldn't hold water. By heating small stones and dropping them into a mixture of water and seeds in the basket, I could make gruel. I made a place for fire in the floor of my house, hollowing it out and lining it with rocks. In the village of Gloss Ott, we made new fires every night, but now I made one fire, which I covered with ashes when I went to bed. The next night, I would remove the ashes and blow on the embers. In this way, I saved myself much work. There were many gray mice on the island, and now that I had food to keep from one meal to the other, I needed a safe place to put it. On the face of the rock, which was the back wall of my house, were several cracks as high as my shoulder. These I cut out and smoothed to make shelves where I could store my food and the mice could not reach it. By the time winter was over and grass began to show green on the hills, my house was comfortable. I was sheltered from the wind and rain and prowling animals. I could cook anything I wished to eat. Everything I wanted was there at hand. It was now time to make plans for getting rid of the wild dogs, which had killed my brother and would kill me should they ever come upon me unarmed. I needed another and heavier spear, also a larger bow and sharper arrows. To collect the material for these weapons, I searched the whole island, taking many suns to do it. This left only the knights to work on them. Since I could not see well by the dim fire I used for cooking, I made lamps of the dried bodies of little fish which we called sai sai. The sai sai is the color of silver and not much bigger than a finger. On nights when the moon shines full, these little fish come swimming out of the sea in schools so thick that you can almost walk on them. They come with the waves and twist and turn on the sand as if they were dancing. I caught many basketfuls of sai sai and put them out in the sun. Hung up by their tails from the poles of the roof, they made much odor, but burned with a very clear light. I made the bow and arrows first and was pleased when I tried them that I could shoot farther and much straighter than I had before. The spear I left to last, I wondered as I smoothed and shaped the long handle and fitted a stone collar around the end, both to give the spear weight and to hold the spear point, if I could make this point the way the men of our tribe did, from the tooth of a sea elephant. Many nights I thought about it, wondering how I could possibly kill one of these great beasts. I could not use a net, because that needed the strength of several men, nor could I remember that a bull elephant had ever been killed with an arrow or with a spear. Only after they had been caught in a net were they killed and then with a club. We killed many cows for their oil using spears, but the teeth were not large. How I would do this I did not know. Yet the more I thought about it, the greater was my determination to try. For there was nothing to be found on the island that made such good spear points as the tusk-like teeth of the bull sea elephant. Okay, so last question for this video. How come it took Karana longer to build her house? Think about two reasons from the story that they gave for why it was a little bit more difficult for her. And then after you think about that, I just want to say thank you again for sticking with me and going through this whole novel. It's been such a blast for me because I love this story. And let's continue going on into the next chapters. See you next time.